My brother, who I wrote the script with, and Dave Fajario, who I wrote the script with, uh, the other two writers are here, so I might as well let them stand on the stage. Um, Super early, like they didn't. We didn't get acquired at the festival or something, and put their name at the start. They, uh, it, when it was film district, they had sort of come to the project and said they didn't really give us much money or anything like that, but they said they'd help us with distri distribution. So big thanks to them. Big thanks to my family, who a lot of them are here tonight. Uh, David's family's here tonight, so it's just uh, really special for us to, and humbling to get a share of like all this work for you guys. So thank you so much. Um, yeah, any crazy questions? <laughs> uh, yeah, just lots of tip-offs throughout the film, obviously. So yeah, maybe certain things that they look silly or whatever, it might be because they are silly. All right, let's wrap this up. This is bad. Oh, gee. They're always good. About the casting process, how you got people, and since it was, I'm not gonna say it was like The Matrix, because it wasn't, but almost being trapped within that world, was there any, did you purposely cast Loris Fishburne because of that, or? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, because somebody came up to me and like, man, Loris is That's such so a sweet. face and a voice. And somehow you managed to make him a face and a voice. Um, you know, honestly, it was such a huge surprise. And, and you know, you write sort of something that does look kind of crazy on the page, and you have these producers who believe in you and say, like, "Yeah, that's awesome. That sounds like Let's do it." And somehow he got a hold of the script. It wasn't even like I was like, "Oh, let's get Lawrence Fishburne." Um, he just uh, they said, "You know, we've been sort of pushing it around and." And he had an interest, and then the second I said that, I was like, oh man. Then you just like go to sleep every night, staying awake, going like, oh, I hope, <laughs> I hope he wants to do it, you know? And then I get a call, and there's just this like big voice on the other end, like, look at him. I think it's script, and I love it, you know? And it was like, ah, it's the best feeling, you know? So he, he didn't know I had another film um, or anything. He just read the script, and he turned the pages and really enjoyed it. So. And then with Brenton and Olivia and Bo, the kids who are the sweetest people in the world and so like special to work with. Um, I just met with them at different times. Sometimes it was with Skype because I was prepping for so long. It was really short, it was a very, very, very modest budget and a very short schedule. Um, so I prepped for a really long time and just kind of took it upon myself to live out there in Albuquerque. And uh, I would often Skype with those guys and they were so sweet to like kind of develop as we got into the project. But, uh, that was the longest answer ever. <laughs> Sorry. Well, then, okay. yeah. Come on. How many days do you shoot for everything filming? Uh, 27 days. I have a question. Did you uh, have to change your like special effects or any, anything from the script once you got on location and had like technical or logistical challenges that, that forced you to change the script a lot? Yeah, quite, quite a bit. Uh, yeah, it's like constantly throughout the movie you're sort of like, I'm not really a very good uh, digital, I'm more of a, I came up as a cinematographer, so I, I'm always trying to think of ways to do things in camera, and I like to build things, and I, I like to try to do practical effects, so like my brother and I built the trampoline system that shot up all the stuff when Joni hit the ground, and I was always trying to find practical ways to do things, and I'd gone to Legendary, who was like, for a, a nerd like me, it's like, you go into that place and you're just like bowed down, it's so awesome all the stuff that happened there. Like, you're just like, I went to them and I was like, I have no money, but will you make me some legs and some arms? <laughs> and they were just like, uh, you know. And I showed them part of my first film and stuff. I sh I, I, my first film, I built a space station in my backyard, and the guy was like, oh my god. He was like, all right, let me talk to your producers, you know. And they ended up doing us a huge favor of building that stuff. But in the end, unfortunately, the legs were just too hard to pull off. Uh, with practical, like practically. 
So we ended up using our prosthetics as tracking devices to do it um, in visual effects. And uh, Spin VFX up in, in Canada did like an amazing job. And they just gave me rules, like really intense rules of how to do this on a budget. And, and that was like, I was never allowed to like tilt and pan the camera. I could only like pan the camera or, you know. There was all these little cinematography rules I had to stick to to, to get this done on our budget. So. Like the lady in the car and the bus driver, were those other humans that they were doing tests on, or were those like alien aliens trying to recreate humanity? I, I will, I will. If you want to find me later, I'll answer that question. But I will tell you, there's hints in the fish. The fish are the answer to your question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm hints that answer. I'm so sorry. Is the notion that they've been captured by aliens at the very beginning when they encountered the MDE and then Area 51 is sort of the process of socializing them to the alien realm? And, and when do they leave Earth? Is Area 51 still on Earth or is that in the alien, alien realm? <laughs> uh, yes, all of that. <laughs> It's just like, it's just sort of like, I, I'm, I'm good. I love the movie Powers of Ten, and I love the idea that things could be infinitely bigger or infinitely smaller. So that's just sort of like pulling out further and further from their ship. From where they are. It might be a ship. I don't know. It's so big. <laughs> I started to think of what it was, but the idea was so big I couldn't fit it on the screen, so it sort of just keeps pulling out. Russian nesting dolls. Uh, so at the beginning when you were doing like the uh, internet trace routing and GeoIP stuff, was that like, did you have like a tech expert guy come on board or was this, could it, I love to watch movies where they're doing that stuff because I'm like a computer guy and they're like, yeah. to look for faults and it looks pretty beautiful. <laughs> Thanks, man. My cousin is, uh, my cousin actually goes to MIT and um, he was really bummed we didn't put the little, I guess they have like a little beaver ring that they wear. He's like, your movie's cool, man, but you gotta put the beaver ring in. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, well, on stage, you're like, you're like, yeah, it would be cool to put the beaver ring in, but I don't know if anyone will ever know what that is. So anyways, I, a lot of that stuff was just questions through him and, and, uh, and him helping us. So, and I've been to, I used to go to DEF CON all the time, and like, uh, I, I'm not like a good hacker or anything. Like that. But actually, I'm not a hacker. But I still love that culture, and I love like the idea of exploding security faults and finding sort of ways that I just love texture. I just really think that to me, like, if you're gonna make a movie, you might as well put a lot of stuff in it. And I, I, I just personally <coughs> like the representation of what's going on in the character to be physically represented with them, so. Huge fan of love. Can't wait for the Civil War battle to come out. <laughs> but, Thank um, you so much. I was just uh, curious as how the budget compared to love and then also how you as a director from that film to this. Sorry, yeah, what was that? I was curious uh, <coughs> on the budget, oh, compared was... to Love, uh, you know, was it more or less, and then also uh, how you feel you've grown as a director since that film? I'm I don't know if I grew much, but I'm still trying to grow. Um, every, every one is a process. Uh, Love was about 500,000, and then this was about $4. Um, dollars. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, now, I, you know, you've learned so much. I think on this one, what I learned the most is, you know, in the writing process with my brother and Dave here is that, like, when you create stuff, it's like you're talking to the tip of a megaphone, and by the time you actually get it out there and get involved in it, it's like, it's like it comes out of the megaphone so differently than what you expected. Um, but I, I think the main thing I learned on this is, you know, a lot of I did by myself, basically. And my brothers would help me build some of that stuff. And, and that was a really lonely, sort of like weird journey for me. And this was a lot of teamwork and a lot of like working with a ton of people in a very short schedule with very limited funds and everyone saying no all the time. And so when you're by yourself, like you're the only person who really says no to you, you know, and you know how much money's in your pocket, you know. But when there's a grand scheme and a big film happening, you're, you're constantly at the whim, like you're sort of like trying to gauge where different people are at and whatnot. And I think the best thing I learned from this was just that, uh, like, you know, these films take so long, they take up such a chunk of your life, that you really gotta love what you're doing. And I, I feel like the things in this movie are sort of made for the 17 year old version of me, you know, so I just, it's fun to be able to do that. I uh, love the movie. Um, can you tell us about how the idea started for it? Something maybe you, were, you know, talked about as brothers growing up, or did you, did you want to make a movie about human will or aliens, or how did that start? I sort of like feel like as we, I want, I want, like I'm always torn between trying to do something special emotionally and then also like just doing something fun. And so there's always sort of like a tug of war with me in that sense. Um, but you know, between my brother and David, we thought it'd be cool to make a movie about the people who were abducted but didn't know they were abducted. And getting into that process and figuring out who these characters are, are um, you know, I was thinking a lot about the idea of like technology and where we are today and how things, as they become more logically driven and more technologically based, like ones and zeros, you know, I wanted to have this character who is struggling in her life with sort of making, trying to be logical he thinks that's the stronger way to think. He thinks to be logical, to make yes or no decisions and to push his emotional stuff away would make him a stronger person. And I think like, you know, I wonder if down in the future as like, you know, we progress and things happen, like are those logical choices going to become so simple and mundane that you just wake up and you eat to survive and you live for a thousand years, but you don't like have any emotion because emotion is great and it's wasteful and it's, it's like it's a zone that you know creates crazy things sometimes. But I sort of like thought it'd be interesting to try to uh, show that like maybe emotions are like one of the strongest things that can power us as humans and that they've led to some of the greatest things about humanity. Sort of making a decision on a feeling as opposed to a logical answer. So, anyways. I'm sure you're like, oh, I didn't think that from the But anyways, it's just something that's always, always been interesting to me. You never really showed how the main character lost the leg, or lost the ability to leg. Is that purpose, or did you just, you know, put it in? Why? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's just, you know, you sort of have to make creative decisions about how you're going to tell a story and whatnot. The answer's in the fish, fill in the gaps. <laughs> <laughs>